Good enough. Class motto. Good enough. For today, it is faithful and ironic. For the life we need in order to doom act. How the life we need in order to live dooms us to a life that is never really ours. He asks the question earlier, what's the lie? That's the question, yeah. Uh, is it, I feel like it's like talking about how the concept of um, how the people try to live and do everything that like, the majority of people think is like, good or cool or whatever, like, like going to college or something, and they end up, I guess, I think especially at a young age when some kids like, I want to I wanna do this, and then their parents are like, oh, you're not, you're not going to make a lot of money if you do that, you know? As they grow up, they're like, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't do that. But then, there's like a very rare, like, I guess, group of people that do think of themselves, like, completely, rather than, like, gravitating towards, like, the majority of so, the like, right thing to do. So, in that context, there, what's the lie? The lie? Yeah. Uh, you need to, I guess, it's not really need to, but if you, if you want to be happy and successful, you need to be what everyone else is doing. Do most people seem happy to you? No. no. Do most people seem successful to you? Some. Some. Depends where you are in other areas. What's that? Depends where you are, like the areas that you're in. How do you mean? Huh? How do you mean that? It's like, obviously if you like people like Mark and like, through this, the national city, you know, they're, li they're living in that position, like, they're not too successful. But if you go like up, I was there, you can see people like their houses, more cars, you know, more money. Uh, so off of that, how are you defining success? Success? Yeah. Like well, wealth, money. What else? The lie could be how we feel. How do you mean? As in, uh, we keep telling ourselves that we're happy when we know that we aren't. We just smile for the pain? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it could be like the illusionary truth effect, where if we repeat something enough, then we believe it to be true. Yeah. What would be an example of something like that? Besides, I'm happy. Believing that everything is fine? Yeah. As, the, as the house burns around you? Yeah. yeah this is this is okay. I won't need a heater this winter. Yeah. Thinking that you're a genius. Thinking that you're a genius. Huh. Explain. Like, I'm not smart. I need you to explain that. Like, like oh, like, I'm so smart. But then, then I guess you're be... So you're saying that that would be uh, a lie that's risen? What is a genius? Who's oh, smart? So how is it that that's how that would lead us to live a life that's not really ours? Yeah. We're fooling people around us, maybe even ourselves. Okay. So how would so so if you going off that example, then if a person believes that they're a genius, how would that lead us to live a life that's not really ours? How, how would that that fooling thing? Cause, like, in other words, how would it change the way in which a person lives? Well, it could be like the, if I don't know, I don't know example, where if you think you're a genius and you won't go around acting like one, you will think that you don't need to know anything else to stay that way. So what's the doomness there, though? Like, in other words, how does that make a person's life I guess, less well off than it otherwise would be? In other words, if you, like, what's the harm? What's the doom in someone's life if you walk around like, I'm a genius? Like, think about how a person would live if they thought they were one. Yeah. You want to be, like, ignorant or arrogant? True. True. You say they wouldn't, they wouldn't change? Like, the daily life, you know? They would miss out on things that they could learn, or? Yeah. Or even things they could be doing otherwise. In other words, if you, if you walk around and you think that you're, that you're highly intelligent, you're a genius, what, what do geniuses do? Learn. Learn. Well, what do very smart people do? Keep wanting more. 
Wait, wait, and how do, yeah, but how do they do that? What's the process? Like, if, for example, um, when you look around school and you see other students who are who are very uh, who are very smart, what kind of things are they doing? They hit it with like what's that? Studying. So studying. So if you think that you're very smart, if you think you're a genius, you're going to start doing genius stuff. You'll start, you know, acting like like the one. And now we might think like, well, that's good. That, that might be good. But it might not be because it might not be the life that that really is yours. You know, like for example, um, I've talked before that um, was it, about a third of the population in the country has a college degree, and that's a that's you know fine. But understand that we gear like 100% of our education towards getting people into college, which means that we're, gearing, we're, we're creating an educational system that really ignores the, the wishes of 70% of the population. And even that 30% who do go off and, and, and go to college and get degrees, I wonder how many of them were kind of driven into it and pushed into it when they really wouldn't have chosen that otherwise. You know, if other things were, were available. So let's say, for example, if in high school you had, uh, you had it available to you to, um, to take auto tech, for example. I wonder how many of you would, would, would have taken auto tech. I wonder if they had like, um, carpentry stuff available, you know, woodworking and stuff like that. How many people would have taken that in high school? I wonder, you know, so on all these different kinds of courses. Like one of the complaints I, I hear from, from people is, oh man, in high school we didn't learn anything like about taxes and about, about uh, you know, how to cook and stuff like that. You know, there used to be a class called home ec, home economics. That was geared specifically towards all of those practical life skills. And we got rid of it. Why? Because we wanted everybody to, to go to college. And so what that means is a lot of people are, are pushed into directions that don't really reflect their life desires. They aren't things that people would normally do on their own. And so it's, it really isn't a life that maybe that we, were, that we chose so much as a life that, that we were kind of pushed into, you know? Um, yeah. Others. All those ideas. Yeah, we tend to think of it just like as a, as a very one-dimensional thing, like, well, you know, if you just think, if you, if you, if you want to be smart, then just do what smart people do. Um, yeah, th there, there's something there. You will grow in that one area. But if that area isn't for you, then that's the important. Um, taking a step back, we talked a bit about what a cultural anthropologist was. Can we look up who Ernest Becker was? Oh, too bad. That would, that, would, that would give you a lot of insight. Um, this is coming from a, from a book called The Denial of Death. Uh, Becker writes this book in 1973, and essentially in the book he argues that all of our human activity is geared towards this denial of death. Now, not, not just denying it, I, mean, I guess denying it, it exists, but also kind of denying it in the sense of trying to put it off as long as possible. So he argues that all human action is geared towards this, at this, this attempt to deny death. Um, we, we ignore it, um, we, we take pills and things to try to prolong life to, to, to get rid of it, uh, to try to ignore it, but ultimately he argues that it's the, kind of the unconscious motivation of all human action. I mean all human action, even in terms of like so if I'm, if I'm deciding what to eat for lunch, that's, that's based off of a, den a, a denial of death, he would say, yeah. Because when you're eating, you're trying to deny death. You're trying to feed yourself so that you don't die. Um, and he talks about ways in which we kind of uh, try to combat that, if this makes sense. So for example, um, he argues that we, we put these barriers, between, that, that the ultimate enemy is death. He argues that the ultimate enemy is death, and that the kinds of battles that we wage in life, those are really just proxy battles against death. So, for example, um, there's you, and then there's, I don't know, death. <laughs> Whatever. I was going to make a Grim Reaper, then I was going to make a ghost, so it kind of ended somewhere in between. Right, so there's you, and there's death. And this is the ultimate fight. And in the battle of you against death, guess who's going to win? Death. Death. Yeah, it's the ultimate statistic. Ten out of ten people die. You can, you can look that up. It's absolutely true. Ten out of ten people die. Now, I was looking recently, just yesterday, I was reading this article where we were trying to figure out just nutritionally how it is that we prolong life. 
And there's some researchers who are looking at this kind of gene therapy that they think will be available not to me, maybe, but maybe to you guys, certainly to your grandchildren, that will allow you to live to about a thousand years old. God damn. Now, yeah, but I'm always skeptical of those kinds of claims because you don't have to prove them. You know, like they say, like, hey, in 50 years we're going to have flying cars. We've been saying that for 100 years. But that's we, we, you can put a prediction that's so far out that you don't actually have to live up to it if you follow. And so, um, so the idea is that there's this battle of you against death, and that everything else, all of the other battles that you wage, are just a proxy battle against death. So, for example, um, you, uh, earlier you mentioned success, and by success, you define it as wealth. So if you're, if you're trying to, to strive for this thing, what's the thing that you're trying to defeat? Poor. Poor, yeah, poverty. And so he would say that, that poverty is simply a, a proxy for death. So rather than having to deal with, with this, which is the real problem, we occupy our time dealing with these other things that are not really the real problem. You know, why? Because these things are actually manageable, manageable to us. This is the thing that terrifies us and is so final and so undefeatable that we just can't approach it. We have to approach these other things. And by, do, and by maybe being victorious in some of these other things, you know, maybe that's going to give us some sense of, of, of victory over this. We're never really going to actually win against it. But that could be things like, I think about your, your goals in life, it could be family, it could be success, however it is that you, know, um, you define it as, as wealth, however it is that you define it, family. Um, what are some other areas that people will strive to kind of be victorious in, in life? Besides you know, having a family and success, um, happiness, oh. yeah. And you know, notice that these are all vacuous things. You know, these are all vacuous things that don't really have an endpoint. So, for example, to have a family is having a family enough? No. What do you, what do you mean? What would you need for, for it to be to be a successful family? You tell me, you said no, having a family wasn't enough. What, what features of this family would have to be in place in order for it to be successful? Yeah. Time. What's that? Time. Time. So you have to, so it has to be a family you can put time into? Spend time with? Yeah. Dedication. Dedication. How would your family have to turn out? Like when they say, like, you know, I love my kids no matter what. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. But I wonder how many of you feel like, like you've got to do something to make your parents prouder, to make it worthwhile. And you ever, you ever wonder if your if your parents look at your family and just go, "Man, this sucks. <laughs> this wasn't what I planned for it to be." You know? And I wonder what. Yeah, I guess I'll ask that. And of course, it's going to depend on the people. Some people, like when they'll talk about their family, they'll say like, "Oh, I'm proud of my kids. My kids all turned out fine. None of them are in jail." It's like that's your that's your measurement. That's your only goal? <laughs> Keep my kids out of jail for the most part? Or is it or is there something else that's deeper there? I guess what I'm saying is that this is a very hard thing to define. But that's good because it gives us a chance to, you know, because it's so vague, it gives us a chance to kind of spin our wheels for a long time, and then we never have to deal with this real thing over here. And then we'll say things like, oh, but I make a family, I have kids, and that way I kind of leave something of myself behind in the world. And by doing that, it's kind of like I'm going to live forever, because we're trying to defeat that. You know? We're going to have wealth and success. That way, again, we can leave something. We, we create something. We create some sort of meaning in our life. Because if, if all that life is is to live and to die, if that's all that there is in life, if there's no meaning beyond that, then this whole thing, it, it's impossible to live this life. Because there's so much suffering. There's so much evil. There's so much wicked. There's so much that can drag you down. And we have to believe that there's something good in it, that there's something that, that can transcend that suffering to make existence worthwhile. And so by doing that, we say, well, I'm going to earn some money, I'm going to you know, leave something to myself, I'm going to you know, conquer in some way. That's just a proxy for conquering the unconquerable. Yeah? And if I ask you, like, how much money do you have to be, how much money do you have to have to be successful? Does anybody have a dollar amount? A dollar? A dollar amount. Oh. 
10 million of them? Uh, 20 million? A billion? And it's funny, because we'll see the very wealthy people and we'll be like, man, how much is, you know, they've got too much. How much is too much? How much is enough? How much is not enough? These are all vacuous things that we can't answer. But that's, again, the thing. It allows us to spin these wheels and then not talk about the real thing that's underlying all of it. Same is true about happiness. You know? If we can convince ourselves that we're happy, then we can convince ourselves that this whole existence thing was worthwhile. So that even at the end, if I die, well, at least I lived a happy life. You know? And again, how do you define that? We can't define it. We can give facets of it. We can say, well, happiness is when you have a family. And says, no, 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 no. Don't tell me, what, tell me what it actually is. Don't tell me what it contains. Tell me what the thing itself is. Well, we can spend the next hundred years talking about that. Yeah. And then not dealing with the real problem of life. You know? There's this old story. Uh, I don't know where it came from. I don't remember anymore. But in short, it's about a guy who's running through a jungle, and he's being chased by a tiger. Um, and he's running, he's running, the, t the tiger's closing in on him, and he gets to the end of, of, the, of the run, there's a cliff. So he's got this choice. He can either fight the tiger or go over the cliff. So he looks down the cliff, and he sees this vine hanging down. So he's like, oh. So he grabs the vine, and he starts to lower himself down. And he gets to the end of it, and he's hanging out. And at the top, the tiger still sees him. The tiger's not giving up. He's just like circling, just waiting for this guy to climb back up. So the guy's sitting there, he's like, well, I guess I'm going to have to hold on. And as he's holding on, the vine starts to... And he looks down, and there's a bunch of rocks down there. So if he lets go, he's going to die. If he climbs up, he's going to die. And so as he's looking around, he notices these little berries are kind of growing out of the cliff wall. He's like, oh, that's so interesting. Those are pretty berries. This is life. Follow? Oh, I see. We distract ourselves with the pretty berries of life because the other things that we have to deal with are so insurmountable and frightening that we just don't want to approach it. Yeah. To deal with the thing as it really is. You know? It's frightening, it's scary. And so what Becker argues is that the way that we can actually make a real meaning out of life is to deal with the real things of life. Not the, not the nursery play toys that, that, that symbolically represent this thing, but to deal with the actual thing itself and to come to terms with it, and to come to, uh, to peace with it, and reconciliation almost. And once you can do that, then all of this other stuff is just icing on the cake. But you also realize that this, doesn't, this, this is not what makes it worthwhile. This adds joy to it. Like I said, people who say money doesn't matter, they either have a lot of it, or they have none of it. Those are the two categories of people who believe that money doesn't matter. The same is true about family. People who have no family, people who have, who have, who have a lot of family. People who have, you know, happiness. People who, you know, these are the things that will, that will end up being the icing on the cake of life, as it were. But that only happens if you deal with the, if the real issue itself, the real underlying motivation. Because otherwise, in the same way that we were saying before, we're pursuing a lie, we're pursuing the lies of life, in the same way. But that, then that means that it's not really a life of our own. We're, being, we're actually being manipulated by this fear to pursue these things. So if you want to not be manipulated, deal with the thing itself. Once you've dealt with that, then you know that the things that you're pursuing in life are the things that you really genuinely want and are of you, not born of fear and expectation. Questions? Comments? Concerns? Complaints? Criticisms? Critiques? Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Mm.